So this is early work. I think uh, we got a grant from uh, Sloan to, to work on this, and originally it was to work into the uh, confidential census files, in which we have a group that's quite experienced. The IRS, for uh, Kathleen didn't, has not heard this, the IRS, for unknown reasons, delayed accepting our uh, application uh, for about a year, uh, which is just unheard of in every week. Jim Davis of the Boston Center would say, oh, it's going to come in a few weeks, don't worry, et cetera. We received it Friday. So any numbers you see here have been generated, but you know, there'll be no numbers from the confidential census things. And so what you're going to see is, a, is an interesting uh, shift. What were we going to do during this period of time when we could not do the detailed research plans that we, that we, that we did? And I'm going to give you a set of data that, will have none of the confidential census things in it. And then our trick is going to be, how do we use this new data that we've been generating and new things in there? And I will start with, I'm going to tell you about the puzzle. We got interested in, in the older workers on the notion that, gosh, older workers are not so good with cell phones, computers, technical knowledge. Uh, they, they can learn to say uh, machine learning, but they can't write programs in machine learning or whatever it happens to be. And we have a huge demographic shift that says older workers are now twice the share of the U.S. workforce as they were uh, in 2000. It's been a gigantic uh, change. And I, I, I've always been a, somebody who believes supply and demand, and I sort of said, well, doubling the supply a, probably a decrease in demand because the technologies are not, people aren't adept at the technology as young people, the older workers should be suffering. Um, but as you, everyone here probably knows, and I didn't know until I started looking, looking at, the, at the, the data, the older workers have done w way better than younger workers, uh, both in, a, in their growth from low levels of employment to 65 and you know, older groups, and in terms of their uh, income and wages. So that's the puzzle I regarded as, and there you have the statement of the puzzle. The methodology for studying the puzzle was to take technology, and I'm very, not to morally against or anything, but to, treating technology as a residual in a regression or as a time trend is obviously not very satisfying to anybody. And so we're going to get real measures of technology. And then we quickly realized that technology is bought by firms. And we have data of firms in industries. Um, but the changes in the job market, almost all of the analyses, have been based on occupations and workers. So you could imagine having workers in two, or in two different industries. One might be affected by a technology because that industry is invested in it. The other one might not. And that gives us the methodology for, for trying to do this. The input data are coming on the basis of industry or firm. We don't yet have the firm because we don't yet have the in, in, internal. Uh, we didn't have when we did, we did this. And, and, and then we, we didn't say, well, what do we do with these occupations? What you quickly learn and you probably know in, in, in intuitively from reading all the newspaper stories about robots are taking this job or that job, it's always about some occupations. And the US now has this ONET database, which is online. It's massive. I was originally very suspicious of it, because you start looking and you see there are hundreds of messy variables. Turns out gathered in different ways, sometimes from surveys of workers, about what goes into their job, sometime from experts reporting. They revise the numbers, I would say, uh, not regularly, but not infrequently, number of revisions. And that's the, where you see the technology hitting at the occupation level. So the, the, the name of, the, of our, uh, the, where the process we're doing is using the data from firms and industries as to the technology changing, we don't have good national data on asking workers, are you now working with a machine that you did not work with before, et cetera? And 
I'll give you one. I said I better give one finding or discuss it much. You might think we, we we're just going to talk about things. We, we've done an analysis of the robots across industries for all workers, and we found it's very consistent with a very different methodol uh, uh, methodology that Darren Asamoglu and Restrepo, his, his co-author, have in a paper. Uh, that indeed wages and employment in industries which have the occupations that are said to be you know, automatable, though they indeed the wages fall in the industries where, where, and the employment falls. I originally thought, ah, now we'll just divide this data by age, and we'll see it's the young who have the big falls and the old who don't. And we don't see that. And I'm very puzzled at the moment about what, what we're seeing pretty much similar wage cuts for young and older workers. And there's got to be a much more depthful analysis if we are going to, to find, which I, my prior is, is clear, that robots are, robots are industrial machines, and mostly in manufacturing. They primarily do blue collar heavy work. They do some blue collar skilled work. Welding robots are the biggest selling robot in the world. And those should take away jobs from traditional blue collar, mostly men, but in the automobile industry, which is the heaviest. But the other places, women as well. And they shouldn't be affecting uh, older people who are no longer doing much physical labor. So that's the, but we didn't see it in our first cut. <laughs> and then we're a little bit, little bit thing here say, well, if it's not that, what is it that is preserving a good labor market for older people uh, in the face of a doubling of their numbers relative to younger people and uh, the technology? Now I'll just run you through some, 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 some information. Just, I've discussed the puzzle. And I made just one other point in this, in this slide. There's a very nice paper uh, uh, by Oter and Dorn in 2009 that also fed into our original expectations. Because they said older workers are more likely to be in routine uh, jobs. And routine jobs are what all the people say, those are the ones that are easy to computer on. And so something is, is, is not adding up. And it may be they used a 1980 measure of routineness. And now, with his own net, we have multiple ways of defining routine is maybe has something to do with that. And there's other possibilities that I, I won't uh, do. This is the um, supply thing. And I, you, you may have seen these numbers. When I uh, first saw the research system brought them in, and I was going to a conference in New York, and I got so upset, I said, this can't possibly be. If you look at the share of workers older than 55, it goes from 12% in 2000 to 22% in 2015. If you add in the share of workers, to the, it, it goes basically 13% to 26%. I said, there's got to be a mistake. How could he have made a mistake with this data? And so I then spent the, the, the night in a hotel downloading BLS data and making sure this was right. And then he, he told me a few days ago, he was going all back over some stuff, and he looked at this, and he also panicked. <laughs> Not knowing how to already panic, and she went to check his own numbers. It's a huge, huge change, uh, and 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 that's where the, the supply. When you get supply movements of this kind, it almost has to be the people are having uh, supply problems, but the older workers have not. They they've done done better than younger people. Um, this shows we took the we we look at every education group, the share of the uh, uh, older people, the 55 plus, this now is 55, including the 60, the ones past 65 and older, except for less than high school. Well, less than high school is, of course, a, in the US is a declining fraction. These are the share of these older workers in the entire workforce. So every, every group, everybody's getting older. It's not it's in that sense. Uh, uh, I mean, all the categories. And then, um, what's the, 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 the puzzle is about the income is, 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 is looks different. This is, again, I'm doing shares, the older worker share of different groups. 
that's just to keep all the metrics the same. So these are the shares of older people in labor market earnings in, by quintiles. And in every group, the older workers increase their share because they're doubling their share of the, of the workforce. Uh, but then you see the biggest increases are, are at the top. So and I, I, if for dramatic purposes, you can go look and say there's a five-point increase of the older people in the bottom quintile and a 14% increase in the top quintile. So a, a chunk of the rising inequality in the country that I don't think is, it's not that people haven't, what's the word, have this in their numbers. I'm sure they have. I'm sure they've remarked on it, but hasn't really been given the attention that perhaps it deserves is the, the here we have this huge number of old people, older people. Um, I would like to deny, but it is true I'm one of them in, in, this, in this category. Um, and and the, the share of the income distribution has just gone huge. Okay. Now I want to talk about the technology shocks that, that, that we we're thinking about. This. The robots, as of uh, 2016, the last data I had, the U.S. had 331,000 robots. There's an a business group, the uh, uh, International Federation of Robotics, that counts robots. <laughs> and they get all the robot manufacturers to report whom they sell the robots to. It's a, it's a strange business survey because you count robots, you don't count the value of robots, you don't count the prices. But So what we have is just numbers of, of, of robots. It's zoomed up. But this is not a giant shock <laughs> to the labor market in the sense of this is, this is our stock. We currently get about 35,000 robots a year. So it's growing at 10%. That's about the right. And you know, we get many more immigrants coming in. We got many more older workers sort of in, in, in this. So it's, it's, it's a modest. We do find much bigger potential effects on workers from software. I'll give you some software expenditures. And now, uh, only because we, the census, the IRS delayed our use of the things, or we've, we've put together a brand new data, database ba based on some, some industry level, uh, or excuse me, company level uh, information, which will be able for us to say which software is bought by which company and which, what the software is likely to do to work in terms of what its purpose is. And that's going to be, uh, it's a bit different, Kathleen, than what we proposed, but I think it's a vast opportunity to do something really re remarkable with, uh, with, with the data. And this is because I had a super postdoc, and when I said, oh, this project looks like we're in real trouble, I never told you, of course, because I figured we, 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 would, we would figure out what to do, we did. Um, and she said, I can find any data in the world. And uh, she'd also been at one point arrested by Chinese police uh, because she had incredible da Chinese, she had incredible data on China, and she just said, "I got them all from public places, and I can tell you, show you all the websites and the programs." And the police said, "Okay, okay, go." go. <laughs> I think she scared them off with her competence. So, she, so she's got this incredible database that she put together. Now I just want to show you what the robot thinks. The key thing about robots is robots are industrial. Robots. These are not service robots. Your, 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 your money machine, the bank, is not a robot by the definition because it doesn't move. And um, there's, a, there's a very formal ISO definition. The definition means 90% of the robots reported by this federation are in manufacturing, utility, um, in those kind of industries. And so here you see robot intensity by, by, by uh, sectors. And it, it's it's sort of interesting. You, it's, you get computers and peripheral equipment. That's a pretty high wage industry with pretty good jobs. Automotive is, of course, classical uh, uh, industry. That's the, 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 the biggest absolute number. I have these in, inten in intensities. But it, you, go, you go down the list and you say, yeah, it's, it's mostly about manufacturing uh, kinds of things. That's what the robots do. Software hits everybody. And I don't know. 90% of the workforce is not in uh, manufacturing, and that's probably 85% is not in manufacturing and utilities and other 
heavy, heavy stuffs. This is, shows you the incredible increase in software as a share of GDP. Um, and bang. And uh, we've looked at the ICT, which is a survey. Uh, again, we could not access the company data until Friday. Uh, but this is from the, the, what, the, what the census publishes. And, 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 and what you, you see is, I, I think the software over GDP numbers understate the actual growth of software because the data is gathered in two ways. It's, gave, it's gathered as uh, expenditures that you're treating as a, as, a, as a purchase of inputs, more or less. And then it's also treated as capitalized investment. And the capitalized investment is not included here. And I, I don't, if there's somebody here who's really good in, in accounting or whatever, it, 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 we're struggling now to figure out how should we turn this into one number, the capitalized numbers and the non-capitalized numbers. And they're both big. So you might double this, 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 this not, not double, but I suppose I had two percentage points on if we do something with the capitalized thing, depending on what we do. So software is huge, and that's going to affect every worker in every workplace, unlike the robots. This is the expenditures of software, and it is the biggest industry in software is finance. So uh, stockbrokers are disappearing, and uh, you know, banks are disappearing, and whatever money may disappear in, you know, in, in blockchain things or changes. It, 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 it's, it's, it's nature. So we have all this kind of data that one can, one, one can use to look at what's the impact on older workers and younger workers and what's, what's the nature of what they know. So my initial premise for this project was older workers don't know as much uh, uh, about modern technology. They're not born with it. But I said, well, I better provide some data. So this is a set of four different you know, surveys, studies of just showing what you know. Older workers <laughs> do not use the social media as much as young people. They, they, they're less likely to own certain technical devices, dot, dot, dot. Um, and what we don't have here is a test or data on how competent you are. Uh, with the uh, with the machines, and um, but we presumably could get that if we did a, a more search or our own, our own study. So the premise that the older people are not as familiar in, in using these technologies seems to be true in every 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 thing that I've I've seen. Okay, so so I, I, I've I've discussed this that our problem in in, in making the link is that the the it, the, the technology comes to firms or industries, and the people we're concerned with is occupations of workers. And so it says here, age can be identified with the LEHD. Well, we couldn't do that until Friday when they, the census said, OK, uh, the IRS has finally approved your, your thing. Dot. Um, so here I'm just talking about this methodology, uh, which I call it triple difference, because the way we really want to move from do, treating technology as a black box, something is we have a machine. We know which company bought a new machine and which didn't, we, or which industry bought the new one and didn't. So that's a change in time. And then we look within the two industries or firms, and we say, which are the occupations that people tell us are the ones that are likely to be affected by this new machine? So it's a difference change over time, change across industry, or, or, or company, or comparison of companies and, and things, and then occupations within it. That's the, te the technology. OK, now we get to the, to the, to the older uh, uh, workers' things. What, what, what do we expect? Well, maybe the older workers could be disproportionately more or less employed in impacted occupations and industries. They clearly are in different um, uh, uh, you know, industries and occupations. And there's something, uh, so we've got calculations uh, uh, you know, uh, doing that. Maybe within them, they are doing tasks that are more likely to be or less likely to be hit by uh, the new technologies. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, then we have this question with, with the ONET data, you're able to say 
how the tasks of an occupation change over time, because they have multiple measures of the tasks in different, uh, in the same occupation. So it could be older people are in occupations where the, where the tasks are, 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 are changing. And so we've got some correlations of this at this moment. And I just, it doesn't look yet as if we're going to be able to say, hey, uh, the technology hit the young and left the old sort of protected, which would have been the hypothesis that it may be come out. I don't want to be, uh, but I, you like to look at a first tabulation and say, ah, it's there. <laughs> you look at the first tabulation and say, mm, et cetera. So I may have to do more things. The other aspect about this that I didn't realize um, until we started doing the ONET things is how do economists treat an occupation as a variable in, in, in things? Here we're making this the key intervening variable through which the technology operates. So that means tech, the occupation has got to be absolutely critical. <laughs> so if you've been brought up with human capital uh, uh, kind of views, you, you take education, and that captures your thing. So we did some, some calculations trying to say, well, what does occupation add? Well, actually, occupation is a much better predictor of people's uh, er, earnings than is their education. So uh, you can do a lot more, it turns out, with occupation. So I said here, we're doing some other now, ANOVA things, to make sure that occupation, that's fine, is, is, a, is a powerful uh, intervening variable. Because if there's a, there'll be a lot of intra-occupation differences, but if those are really massive, treating it as the intervening variable is not going to be, the, the, the thing that links the workers to the, to the technology is not going to be so good. So um, I, I think that's, that is, you look at the data just once and you say, yes, occupation is really very, very salient uh, in things. And, and so you can, really, really can do a lot with, with that. I think. And now I'm just going to show you some of the ONET calculations and what the things um, lo lo look like. There's the, there's the, the uh, way you can download ONET stuff. It is a... Mm, what's the word? It's not an easy data set to deal with. And um, so table one gives you the content of these ONET stuffs. And they ask you about the, uh, the, the education and training. They ask you about the knowledge. They ask you about the skills. Dot, 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 dot. It, it's, it's, and there's hundred, there's hundred I want, one count I did in one of the occupations, like 120 different variables. People have picked out particular ones to look at. And I became very, you know, not, not, very not, not suspicious in a bad way, because the ones are the same ones that we're picking out. But you, you begin to wonder about the variables you didn't pick out. So you got a really dimensional reduction problem. You do factor analysis, you do something with that. Um, and we, we've, we've done some things with that that make us feel reasonably confident that the things people have picked out and that we'll pick out that you can touch by saying, this is what it is, look. Good. I mean, it, it doesn't look. And here's the nature of things they ask you. Uh, you know, how important is negotiation to the performance of your current job? And they go, you know, that's not, not important, extremely important. So I'm going to say, my job is negotiation important. I negotiate occasionally with a dean, um, but that's pretty rare. On the other hand, maybe it is important because sometimes you negotiate about your salary <laughs> and, and uh, things like that. And, and then what level would, is needed to perform your job? And they go up to being a diplomat. Uh, uh, so, in, so, so there's just a lot of, of occupation information that they are to, to do something with. And I say it requires a bit of stuff. We have another data set that exists, uh, 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 um, the PIOC data set, which also asks about tasks that workers do that is across countries. This is an OECD data, data set. And, I, and here I give you the uh, uh, distribution of answers to questions by age. So we, uh, the, just a footnote, the ONET has nothing to do with age. So you have to do something of taking an occupation and inferring if an occupation's got a lot of older people or very few older people, et cetera. So the, in PIAC, it's very clear. 
is a set of, of skills that fall down as you get older. These are, uh, I think they're, they're not quite five year gaps, but the very the beginning one is, uh, I didn't put it here because I wouldn't have been able to fit them all, all in, but it's like you know, early 20, and the very end is, is, is the last one is like people post, um, I mean like 70, and the, and the, the next to last one is 65 or, or so. And, and, but you do see this, this, these drop-offs, but you also see cases like, does your job usually involve work, sharing work-related information with coworkers? It has a U-shape, or an inverse U-shape, excuse me. And I didn't, I didn't see in this clear things that the older workers uh, were, 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 were like losing out on routine things and, uh, and doing more interpersonal skill stuff. It's not so clear. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, so in any case, we, we look at that. This is, the ONET data has 863 occupations, <laughs> at least that that's we identified. And this is routine work, which is the key one that people you would have said, okay, that's going to get automated away. And you go, with the high occupations here are uh, court reporters, medical transcriptionists, billing cost, and and uh, rate clerks. Well, court reporters and medical transcriptionists probably have some reasonable amount of education. So that's where the occupation and the education might give you different signals if you think that this is these kind of computer stuff are, are doing, uh, 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 benefiting more educated. And then down here, the people who they say they're, they don't do routine work, archaeologists, political scientists. Product. So, and this is real to wide distribution, which is very important if you're thinking about using this. This is the one with social skills. Our original thought was the older guys are doing more social skills. And, and, and that would, uh, there's, well, coaches, scouts, clergy, counseling, psychologists, people dealing with people, and then the people with no social skills, math technicians, you see. There is, I was surprised that just, the number of uh, white collar jobs that are all over the place here. It's, it's not the white collar, blue collar break at all uh, in, in, in this. Okay. Um, th this was the most famous probably paper in, in the, in the, in around, it's a book, Moxford guys. This is where they projected 47% of jobs were going to be taken by computers. Um, and I don't have time but I, I, I have gone through their methodology with some care. And, and um, I'm not going to say they made terrible mistakes, because I don't think they did. But it's not a methodology that you or I would feel comfortable, or most of us. Maybe there are some people here who I don't want to be careful. But, uh, but it doesn't mean they're wrong. I mean, that's, be, 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 you know, it's just that they did it in a certain way. Then there's another survey that I make use of. These guys did a survey extremely well scientifically. When will AI outperform humans at work? And they took 352 experts who published in the leading artificial intelligence machine learning conferences. And I thought when I first saw this fold laundry, you tell me there's going to be an artificial agent controlled machine that's going to fold laundry, but in what? Well, basically today. And there is today on the market an artificial agent controls laundry machine. I don't think these experts knew, you know, had prior knowledge. They, they, they were just answering questions. They wouldn't have known this, as far as I could see. Um, they, 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 they will sell for like $990 or something. Uh, that, so you can have next to your washing machine, your dryer, your folding machine. So, so it, I, Truck drivers next. You go down the list. It looks fairly sensible, and uh, the last occupation to be left for humans is AI researcher, according to their calculation. Which uh, uh, maybe I'm. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. And, and and so I gave the, this, this paper. It's a very. It's just so well done scientifically. Compare. Uh, I don't mean to be downplaying the Frey Eisberg thing. They did something very pioneering and got a lot of attention. But this was really well done. And, and you say, well, maybe these guys know something. This is a 
the last thing I'll do, and then I'll, I'll come to a conclusion. Um, one of the key things in ONET is that the, we have these multiple, over different time periods, surveys of the same occupations, the skills, the at, what they're doing, and so on. And I, so we went to say, well, OK, is there any change in these? Um, so we did a measure of change of these things. And they, they, they look like there's you know, semi-normal distributions. There are some occupations which ONET reports is there are lots of changes in them. And there are some where they report very little changes. And these were changes in routine work, social skills, and automation attributes. And I said, we don't yet know the meaning of changes because there's no ne necessary metric to this. And it's got to be looked at very carefully. But it does mean we will be able to do some before, after, at an occupation level. You know, the accounting profession, presumably, has got to change because the routine work is coming in. And I've actually sat with leaders in the accounting profession about how they are trying to grab off new skills and new things that accountants will be taught uh, uh, so that they can maintain a profession. And that's, this, that's what I think th this is, 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 is doing. Um, this was just my robot thing, which I told you the results. We got negative effects for robots and a whole bunch of different cal types of calculations uh, for both employment and hours. And the, the stuff we just done on age showed no difference. So conclusion, um, we're, we're, we, the technology thing should be showing up more on young people, and we don't see it yet. So that makes it a hard. Uh, uh, thing. And the routine job thing, I'm more puzzled about because Arthur and Dorn seem to have a result that may not be true in more, more recent data. Uh, and so the end is where we were seeing, you're saying, well, maybe this technology is not the reason uh, uh, that the older people are, kind of, they're not in the, the jobs that compete with the new stuff. They don't, somehow they don't have to use the new knowledge. And so maybe there's some other explanations that we may have to go to. But we're, we're, we're giving the technology its best shot, because <laughs> that's really what we're, what we're focused on. We're not focused on trade, and we're not focused on unions and things like that. That's, 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 that's. OK, thanks. Um, it started when uh, you were a discussant who receives a paper only a few days before uh, the conference to complain. Uh, but I'm not going to complain. Um, first, because I didn't actually get a paper. Uh, I only got the slides, <laughs> exactly the ones you saw. Uh, and second, because it was a way, you know, not having the paper was a way for, for me to exercise a little bit of creativity uh, about what the paper is trying to, to accomplish. So this is what the paper is about. Um, old chap with a machine in the background trying to you know, get his job. Uh, now, I'm not a Star Wars fan, so I know this is a good robot, the, the golden guy. So uh, he's actually not going to get the job of uh, this other guy. The Obi-Wan Kenobi is probably going to be more helping him. So this is a story of complementarity rather than substitute ability. Uh, and that's going to be one of the themes, possibly, of the, of the discussion. So what I understood from the slides, what the paper is trying to do is the following. The basic idea is that you have these robots, automation, artificial intelligence, etc., cetera, uh, introduced in the workplace for whatever reason. Uh, and then the idea is that uh, this should be an advantage for people who are young because they are you know, more uh, tech-oriented, uh, and it should hurt those who don't uh, have the skills to profit from, from these two from these new technologies. And this is a sort of a variant of the skill bias technological change. You can call it the age bias technological change. Um, and in fact, there is already literature on this, exploring uh, how uh, workers of different vintage are affected by the introduction of new uh, technologies into firms. And I just put a few um, uh, references there for different countries, different uh, uh, type of technologies, and so forth. Now, the puzzle is that in the data, it doesn't seem to be the case that the older workers are actually um, hurt by uh, the introduction of this new technology, the, the robotification of the workplace. There actually seems to be work 
uh, at a higher rate, they seem to be doing better than the, than the younger workers, and their employment share uh, has actually increased a lot at the very top of the income distribution. So the question is, uh, is why? So the first issue is why do we have increased participation um, of all the workers? And there is, uh, I think, some uh, um, things like you know, the demographics, all the baby boom stuff we know about. There is general improvements in health. Uh, there is perhaps uh, institutional reform of the, of the pension systems. And then there is also the fact that new technologies, uh, and we go back to the uh, to the golden robot before, allow all the workers with uh, perhaps mild health problems to function better in the workplace. This is a case in which um, uh, new technologies actually improve uh, the ability of workers to, to be in the workplace. Um, so, of course, these new technologies may have worked in the sense of slowing down this overall trend. So, without the robotification, we would have seen even larger increase in employment uh, for these younger courts. So, this is what they want to do in the end. They want to do a causal empirical analysis in which they uh, look at the causal effect of the introduction of robots uh, on, uh, on the older versus younger workers ratio, uh, accounting for the fact that there are some general trends pushing older workers into, uh, into the workforce, like things like that. So some people have already done some of these analyses, like uh, the paper that... Um, uh, uh, Richard was uh, uh, citing before, the S.M. Mogler Restrepo, is a paper that looks at uh, uh, the impact of robots uh, uh, on different outcomes. This is the employment rates of people in different age bands, and this is the logo wages. You can see pretty much the type of workers who get uh, you know, big hits on their wages, and their employment is people in the middle of the age distribution. And if you look at the guys, uh, at the very end of the age distribution, people who are um, uh, 66 to 75, they seem to be the only one who actually gain. Uh, and this is somehow part of the puzzle we, uh, we, are, we are talking about. And in any case, even the guys who are 55 to 65, they don't get hurt as much as the people in the, in the middle of the distribution. Um, and, you know, this, is, this one on wages is pretty striking. This is the only group that actually benefits from the introduction of uh, uh, robots. Um, now, this analysis that uh, Asimoglu Restrepo has, you know, some uh, um, uh, problems. So, um, Richard and Codos may not like this because it's done, essentially, it's a cross-section analysis. It looks at two data points. It looks at how changes in employment and in wages uh, is affected by uh, robot exposure. It's an analysis done somehow puzzlingly at the commuting zone rather than the industrial level. So they have to do all sorts of uh, uh, machinery to convert uh, industry level data into commuting zone data, but that's a different uh, issue. So I do agree that the more promising analysis will look at uh, uh, industry occupation. So this is something that you know, eventually the paper that uh, uh, will, uh, will be written will probably be uh, a better way to look at this, uh, this question than, than the thing they've done. Uh, the uh, Asimoglu and Restrepo have done in their paper. So we'll get back to this point about the appropriate variation space. Um, what explains the fact that there is this uh, increased representation of uh, all the workers in the top part of the income distribution? That was something very fascinating. Um, and I thought that this was a simple intertemporal substitution story. We know there's been a rise in uh, inequality, a rise in the return to skills. Um, so this makes the value of the older workers' time much higher, uh, or the cost of leisure uh, uh, much higher. So instead of, uh, you know, they can defer playing golf on the, on the Stanford golf course to the future while uh, they continue to work. So I wasn't um, particularly surprised by that if you believe the simple intertemporal substitution story in, uh, in labor supply. Now, the theoretical effects of the age-biased technological change are not unambiguous. Uh, so it's true the superficial view is, okay, the young workers can use the, the smartphones and the older workers don't, or at least they're not so adept to it, and so we expect certain things like uh, uh, skill obsolescence and failure to adapt. This is the mechanism they, uh, they have in mind. But it's also a positive effect. Uh, technological, in principle, technological and organizational innovation are still skill biased. 
Uh, and may benefit all the workers because the older workers actually do have the skills and the experience uh, to actually benefit from them. So experience never gets old, as in this movie, uh, that I actually quite like. So this guy comes in and becomes an intern for this uh, lady who is just starting a startup. Everybody's, you know, age 25 on average, and then he comes in and solves all their problems. So besides having more experience, there are other... Uh, things that all the workers may be valuable um, in, in a work environment that even one that is robotifying, uh, which is they have more dependability, they exhibit less turnover. And I actually was surprised to find that uh, there are studies that show that they outperform younger workers in terms of semantic uh, memory. I don't know what it is, but uh, I believe it's important. Uh, language and speech skills. Um, so uh, let's um, uh, not forget this. And then let's think about who is threatened by the introduction of uh, robots in the workplace. Um, so suppose that younger workers are in jobs requiring, requiring physical strength and uh, uh, dexterity. Old workers don't have those particular skills. At the end of their working life cycle, uh, they cannot do these jobs, so they get diverted to kind of you know, quieter parts of the, of the workplace or less physically demanding jobs. Now, robots... And the ones that Richard is uh, focusing on, one, so the industrial one, the, the one that, uh, you know, move in the workplace, are really like uh, substitutes for workers in the heavy lifting occupations. So evidence from engineering, as reported by, again, the Asimoglu Restrepo paper, is that uh, the industrial robots, the ones that move in the workplace, actually have been used to automate very labor-intensive tasks in manufacturing, like machining, welding, painting, palletizing, assembling, etc. And these are uh, jobs that are more likely to be, to be done by the middle uh, age workers, which is the reason why you saw this big decline in wages and employment in the middle of the age distribution rather than at the end. Um, and in fact, firms may need to introduce some new technologies to keep their older workers keep productive, uh, like lighting, uh, you know, the height adjustable desk, etc., etc. Again, you go back to the issue of complementarity rather than uh, uh, substitutability. Um, and this is a reverse causality story that they push, even though they take a very macro view. So their macro view is aging societies have, uh, like, you know, Japan and uh, Italy, etc. So societies where the old workers to young worker ratio is increasing, they may respond endogenously. Um, to, um, the, uh, to the aging factor by introducing new technologies uh, to cater to their changing demographics. And in cross-country, actually works very well. The same data that they're using, the, the, the data on uh, a number of robots, or so intensity of robots used in industry in different countries, actually tend to show that Japan, which is the country we think about when we think about aging, is the country that has most robots of all, so more than, than the United States itself. So I looked at some data from BLS to see where the old workers actually are located. Where do they do? And uh, these are the occupation where more than a third of employment is actually from people who are older than uh, 55. So these are something like the, uh, the archivists, the curators, and the museum technician, the bus driver, the clergy, furniture finisher, et cetera, et cetera. You can look at the, a lot of them actually become self-employed and do all sorts of stuff. So, it does look like you know, most of these, not all, but a lot of these, uh, you know, perhaps are the ones that exhibit most of the social skills that Richard was talking about. It's now clear that these are the, the ones that are you know, most threatened by uh, the introduction of, uh, uh, by the rob robotification of the, um, I mean, we would certainly like robots instead of our legislators, but that's a different matter, um, uh, or the clergy, but let's not go there. Uh, it's quite likely that the next wave of the robotification of the workplace is going to take place in the service sector. So, you know, the humanoid service robots, the, co the cobots, uh, drones, artificial intelligence. Said this is probably this is a new wave of robotification coming in that is going to be threatening for for the other workers. But probably that these are effects are not uh, uh, there yet. So the imperial strategy is very challenging. Uh, so they have data on. Uh, um, you know, purchases on uh, robots and software by industry over the last whatever years. They have this on-net data that allows to, um, 
to, to kind of measure how uh, automatable, a terrible word, a given occupation is in percentage. And they have information on how many older workers work in a given occupation, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all sorts of data work going on, uh, but they kind of don't uh, have it at the same level. So they have industry uh, data information, but they don't have any information about robotification at the occupation level. So this is a scheme that I think uh, they're going to use. So they're going to distinguish between industry that have a high robotification or high software use, like uh, automotive, and uh, construction uh, as uh, a very low robotification software uh, um, part or component. And uh, if you've ever done renovation work, you know that. Um, and inside each industry, there are two types of employment, two types of occupation. One is, according to Onet, highly automotable. And the other one, like engineers, both in the auto and the construction industry, instead are scarcely uh, substitutable with, uh, with robots. So the question is, what's the fraction of all the workers in different uh, occupations slash industry combination? If you are uh, a billing clerk in the auto industry, there is an industry that is uh, massively uh, investing in robots and software, you're doomed. You're exactly the type of worker that is going to be hit by uh, this wave of robotification. Uh, but recall the reverse causality. Choices by firms of what kind of technology to adopt may be a function of the age composition of the workforce. So the same kind of principle that exists at the country level may exist at the company level. So they may cater uh, to the type of workers they have before making decisions about what kind of technology to introduce in the workplace. But that's uh, a more general um, um, kind of issue. So, and the last thing is, there is this, uh, you know, the paper starts from the premise that younger workers, the ones that are better equipped to be the beneficiaries of this uh, uh, technology change because they have the ones that are grown up with the tech. So this is, if you have teenagers, you are familiar with this image. Um, so these are the productive workforce of tomorrow. But uh, are the young guys really so ready to profit from the robotics, the AI, et cetera. Well, we know that they can do a lot of things very fast. Right? Texting with two thumbs, you know, text and driving, uh, tweet, Snapchat. Uh, again, I have two teenagers, so I am familiar with all of this. But there is actually an interesting paper um, by Aguiar, Bills, and Hurst documenting that there is a very strong decline in hours and employment for this particular age group. Uh, and a concurrent increase in time devoted to internet and recreational games. That's exactly the technology, uh, the two technologies that have been introduced. It's actually quite uh, spectacular. So this is the uh, market hours of uh, uh, men 31 to 55, and this is the young cohort, so men who are uh, between 21 and 30. Big decline in log hours around the time of the recession, no recovery actually. So there is a sort of permanent decline in market force participation of these uh, younger cohorts. And concurrently, there is a big increase in the time that they, from time use survey, that they devote to recreational computer video games. Okay? So if you wonder what happens in 2006, well, Microsoft launches the Xbox and Sony launches the PlayStation. It's a very big shock for, uh, for game users. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, I enjoy reading these 23 slides and thinking about my future as uh, um, uh, being replaced by technology. And the work is in flux, so I try to give some comments in that sense. Okay. <laughs>